So my name is David Byte. I'm a senior technical strategist with uh, SUSE. And, and I'm Matt Curley. Um, I'm a senior technologist for HPE. So we're here to talk about benchmarking stuff, ideally for real world scenarios. So I'll get things kind of underway. Uh, I want to walk in front of the projector and get blinded real quick. <laughs> The agenda, we're, we're gonna really you know, kind of walk through this. We're gonna start looking at problems that we're, people are trying to solve, use cases, configurations, and the benchmarking methods um, to deal with those. Uh, and specifically, we're gonna look really at the tools and how to read the output and then think about how to design. And the, the intent is for this to be a very interactive session. So ask lots of questions, try to beat us up, specifically beat up Matt, because he's the one that knows everything. So, you say this because there are way more people that are going to get like aggressive with you in this audience. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll get underway. Why benchmark at all? Well, I would hope we don't have to say this, but it's really about understanding the ability of a cluster you've designed and implemented to meet the performance requirements that the applications um, and the lines of business are looking for. Um, Establish performance baselines. You know, when you make a change to a configuration, you know, whether hardware or software or network, you need to be able to go out and figure out, did this make things better, worse, and change nothing. And looking at future component testing. So it's important to um, look at the components in your cluster, understand the individual performance of each of those. Because when you want to scale down the road, you don't want to come in and make a change. So you, say you're using different hardware and uh, select something that's actually going to slow the overall performance of the cluster down. You don't want to have that bottleneck sitting there. So the problem that we have as engineers and sales engineers, or however you want to look at us, consultants, is that most of the time the guys telling us about performance have no idea what they're talking about, right? They come in and say, we need 10,000 IOPS. Of? <laughs> and you're like, OK. Read, write, 4K, 64K. What's the mix? Why? And they don't know any of the answers. So you know, they'll come in and spew off some number they heard or read in some document somewhere and just think it's the right thing. So they'll talk about IOPS and gigabytes per second, as opposed to expressing it in ways that we all know make sense. Thinking about the protocol type with specifics around block file object, IO size, read write mix, um, you know, pulling all these things together, that's the proper way. So ask, you know, whoever's giving you a requirement, ask them lots of questions and see if you can get to this. Now, chances are you probably won't get it all, but you may get closer. So I'm just going to jump in on the use cases. When we get to the really hard stuff, that's when I let Matt talk. So object, we're looking at Rados native, S3, Swift, uh, NFS to S3 buckets. That's what I mean when I'm saying object in relation to Ceph. Um, useful for backup, cloud storage, large data store for applications. A lot of applications now come with S3 interfaces natively in them. Characteristics of object, WAN friendly, high latency, tolerant, um, scales extremely well across massive numbers of users. All right, so now we're, we're gonna get a little into recommendations. The benchmarking comes in a minute, I promise. So when we look at objects, there are some cases when you wanna use journals, um, you know, smaller clusters that may have high write bursts, um, Think about small objects um, and bursty ingest, right? And certainly rebuilds, having um, things that can help offset and, and buffer the back end disk during rebuilds is journals are great for that. Block, RBD, and iSCSI, those are the two protocols we uh, work with. Again, you guys can read. Uh, the use cases are pretty simple. Um, and then file, where we have CephFS, 
Everyone familiar with CephFS? I hope so. Where's Jean? I know he's here. <laughs> um, and this was done early. Application Home was one of the known ones that we're looking at for this. There are some other things that fit well into that that uh, if you want to know more, we can have an offline or maybe a discussion towards the end. Should you use journals in a block? Probably so. Uh, you know, so they're used for offsetting um, I.O., making it run faster, um, and creating consistency in the performance of your cluster. Um, just looking to see if there's anything else I want to make sure I hit on this. Generally recommended block and file use cases. Um, few use cases when you may not need them. If you have an all flash environment, it's probably fast enough for most of your needs. It's possible you could have SSDs, you want to put NVMe in front of them. Okay, that's fine. Yeah. And feel free to. Yeah, I mean, you, you certainly aren't going to need to do a lot of the good use for these with drives, of course, is like you've got the elevator, you've got the head stroking back and forth. And if you throw some of the stuff at SSDs, you can calm that down. Well, I mean, if it's already on SSD, that's not a problem. Yep. And this journals really don't help read performance. Yeah. So that, that they are just there as a transact write buffer. So you can have them all day. They're not going to affect your read IOPS at all. All right. So is everyone ready to talk about benchmarking now? Because <laughs> that's where we are. So benchmark the right thing. Again, this goes back to those questions we talked about the very first. If you understand what they're asking for and looking for and the comp way those combine, now we know what we're going to try to benchmark. So again, understanding the workload. Let's make sure we understand what they actually care about because they may say, well, I need this latency with this throughput, this many IOPS turned out of it. All right, which one of those is actually the important characteristic of the workload? Is it the latency requirement? Or is it the bandwidth? Well, that's a pretty big deal. Watch for bottlenecks. So <clears throat> when you're benchmarking, make sure that you're taking note of where, where um, in the setup you're slowing down. Is it your CPUs getting maxed out? Are you killing the network interfaces and you just can't push any more through them? Um, you know, there are reasons those things can happen. Old drivers may cause some of that, maybe, maybe actually maxing out the physical capacity of the network. And it's even possible that your benchmarking tool is causing the, the bottleneck, yeah. right? Definitely it's, seen people with like, you know, kind of false results because their client and benchmarking loads were maxing out and they weren't really testing their cluster fully. All right, so talking about block and file. So when we look at the block and file, there's a lot of tools out there that you can use, all right? A lot of these are well known in the industry. FIO, it's the current tool that is favored, quite honestly. Um, probably the most commonly used tool today. Next to DD, which I didn't put on here because <coughs> that's Thank not you. really a tool. Iometer. Does, has anyone else in here used Iometer besides me? Ah, uh, yeah, you poor souls. <laughs> but what it did really well was it did, you know, scale horizontally with a very easy to manage job creation interface, right? So it did that pretty well. IO zone, also old and crusty. Um, spec.org, they have a number of tests depending on the particular kind of test you're looking for. Spec SFS is an industry standard uh, that's used for NFS performance. Uh, that's probably the most commonly known and well, best well known. But way more lift than you want for basic benchmarking. Oh, <laughs> yeah. And, and that includes cost. Yeah. Very expensive. Um, again, SPC, it's another industry standard. This is really focused at SAN infrastructure. Um, also, fee-based. Any other thoughts on this? Um, I mean, yeah, you have some stuff. I mean, file. Um, I think Jens also has VD Bench, for example, out yep. there. Um, so you can find some things. But really, what we're focusing on here, I mean, the open source community tends to use it. It's it's com it's common. It's well maintained. It's at least at a high level understood. All right. So we're going to dig a little bit into FIO because that's the tool we would suggest that you use. Um, it has I.O. engines that 
um, are, you can specify in the configuration, specific for iSCSI, RBD. Um, it works very well with CephFS, everything that you can do to the cluster from a block or a file uh, interface. It is included with SUSE Enterprise Storage. It is a package, you just do a, a very simple command. I'll save that for another, another slide because you know I needed a little content on it. But it's very easy to get. Um, you can also go out to the uh, uh, Git site for it, look at the info around it, how to configure it. There, is, there are hundreds of options. It, it's got one of those War and Peace man pages. I mean, you kind of pop through. And this is yep. why we're doing a little bit of detail digging into it because while it really isn't that hard to just basically run, there is a lot of flexibility and power. I mean, exactly. Yeah. And you can see, you know, this this is a, com a single command line. This will run one job, you know, a uh, one single host job. Uh, this is one I actually ran against a uh, RBD run on a or an RBD off of uh, the Apollo cluster. So FIO set up to install it. Zipper in FIO. That's great. SUSE is a fantastic, you know, for offering this for us, right? Um, Works great for single clients. You can use the command line, uh, very easy, FIO. <coughs> and on multiple clients. So I know probably most of you guys have touched FIO, right? How many people have done multi-client FIO? Yeah, it's a little more challenging, right? So uh, one of the things I did over on the right, I put up a simple job file, or a simple file, job file to describe um, you know, how to kick this off. They get much more complex. Jan has got a really big, nasty, evil one he used for his CephFS <laughs> testing. I didn't even look. How many lines were in that file? Do you have any idea? No, I think it was more than that. It, with, with a lot of job <laughs> definition, they can certainly go hundreds of lines, but you can get pretty complicated yeah. in just about 50. Yeah. So it, it, his file did a lot of stuff. It was pretty impressive. Um, it's pretty easy to actually execute, you know, use job files, FIO, client equals server, client equals server. So this is the only really confusing thing they did with FIO. So in most benchmarking packages that have been around a long time, when you say a client, that's the actual load gen engine. Yeah. It's kind of the reverse with FIO, where it says server, that's really the load generating device it just yeah uh, it makes my head hurt a little bit quite yeah. honestly um, I don't know who did that but someone should be beat so we'll get into reading the output and this is where I'll hand it to Matt um, yeah I'll let you take it from here. okay that sounds like a good plan all right so we got a different one this time all right so really what this is just a sample run. It actually has nothing to do with the ran for the benchmark that I got going on here. But I think everyone's seen sort of like the big spam of output. But even I, I mean, there's, there's a lot of different things that you can dig into. Some of them are more useful than you might think. Some of them are, I mean, it just really depends on what you're trying to benchmark. Um, and so we're going to kind of go over some of this overall performance and storage behavior in a simple use case. I mean, you can go so far down this well, because not only is this output available, but you certainly have stuff like a JSON output, and you have the old school um, semicolon yep. delimited brief output, which is really nice for a big sort of matrix of stuff being dumped into things, but is not really good to parse. <laughs> All right, so you start off this stuff right here. If you just spin off a simple job of whatever, there's a small sample thing, you're going to get some information about the running test in terms of this was just a 4K block I.O. thing, and we were using pretty typical asynchronous I.O. tests. And I think you're going to see this for most you know, block benchmarking, and you use the asynchronous library here. And then this is going off and saying, okay, this is the level of depth you are trying to actually save for each job, so how many you want outstanding um, on the target device. And in this particular case, um, you know, you can go off here. Certainly, I did files, so this is more of a file system benchmark in a very limited sense. Uh, 100 is probably smaller than you'd normally do for a small file. But um, you can also certainly go off and do this to raw device and set various things depending on whether it is a raw block or a file benchmark that you're after. 
This next thing, obviously, also very simple, but really it's about, you know, there's a file creation stage, you know, if it needs to be laid out, and there's a completion stage thing. Mostly, I end up using this if you're just going off and doing runs for kind of the ad hoc piece, because often you get into this and you don't know what to expect. So you're going to do some runs and you're going to see how does it settle? Um, how long do I have to get to a settled state? I'm spending, maybe your preconditioning really isn't there if you're doing something like an NDM, et cetera. But you can look at these for some ad hoc runs, et cetera, and then get to the point where you're like, all right, I don't need to watch this. Now I'm actually going to do it in kind of a test matrix. So from there is where all the really, you know, the stuff that if you just need the overall summary you tend to not look at comes out here. Um, so each of these jobs, if you're in this particular output format, gets this breakout. So you're going to get some stuff that says, okay, I mean, here's what the Lynx process was, you know, what I did in overall I.O. and bandwidth and, and uh, IOPS, and how long it took. So, I mean, that, that certainly is useful if you need to break down per. If you just want kind of, I did this much, you might ignore this piece. This, however, summary information is often important when you're looking at really saying, I want to understand um, characteristics for SLA or Aptex. You can start here, and these latency things really break out where your time is being spent. Um, SLAT and the overall latency, so what you're talking about, these three categories, if you're not familiar with them, this is kind of the piece from where the origin of the I.O. is down to the point where it hits the kernel. This is everything else, and this is sort of the sum up. So if you want to benchmark something and you're looking at how is this application going to perform, you may be looking at, say, total latency. Um, this CLAT I, I look at more if I'm just going for kind of a raw, you know, what is this particular OS plus the media probably doing. And I don't use SLAT as much, but it's good to sort of track it in terms of if you really are thrashing a lot in terms of, say, process, et cetera, you might run into stuff where you can really bottleneck on submission, but the media is fine. And you can see that here where the time is breaking out. These next pieces are really for sort of identifying the details there. If you're talking about building an SLA or maybe you have to have some level of reliability, you're going to break into these two places. This is... Um, Basic, basically a histogram, so this is summed, and you'll typically look at stuff, of course, you've got like your median point here, but all, all this over is something called a standard distribution, and a lot of the uh, customers are going to be more concerned with, say, like the 80th percentile latencies, um, 95th percentile latencies, or maybe even uh, to the stuff where they say, okay, if I understand my standard distribution, what, what number of deviations do I have? Is this a four signal latency or whatever? So you really look at this and um, you can say, all right, I have an expectation of what it needs to behave like. So especially if you've got something where maybe it was a database transactive thing or you're really looking for a low turnaround time for your workload, you're probably going to spend some time figuring out what's going on here. And if you have any weird outliers down in the second part, because this gives you more of the clustering of where the latencies were on that particular job. So you can actually take a look and see that standard distribution curve and say, does it make sense or do I have these weird lumps or something like that for error handling? Uh, and you can see that with firmware bugs uh, and things along those lines with drives. You'll see stuff, even NVMe, I've done testing and you watch and it's like, oh, you have this nice cluster and all of a sudden you've got this stuff out here without particularly deep cues and it's over 20 milliseconds long. And you're like, well, that shouldn't be happening. And you may have to go off and talk to the vendor or do sort of a deeper dive there. You can also get some information, obviously, about what the system is doing in a general sense in this sort of <laughs> fell-off format uh, here. But um, this has some of the CPU uh, utilization context switches, page faults, things like that. I mean, really important if you have something in your memory model. Some, you, some of the queue depth, are you maintaining it or not? Um, and the overall I.O. count stuff here. This latency target stat is not something I tend to use a lot, but you can actually do testing uh, with FIO where you're trying to guarantee latency parameters, and so you'll see some information in there about that. And then, finally, this is much more common to actually go and say, I just wanted to see what I got overall for all the jobs together. This may be useful if you're really going down, I and mean, perhaps you were doing uh, either driver debug, or you might have a workload where what you're benchmarking is not the only thing using that device. So you can look into Linux device statistics and really dig down there and see what's going on. You know, IO merges and you know, tick time and stuff like that. So this takes us to object and you want to pop here. Yeah, and before I jump in yeah, into sure. object, one of the things I want to talk to, talk to for a minute 
is really now applying you know, that data that we're able to get out of FIO and the way we can configure the jobs to those questions we asked at the very first. So if you know the workload or probably workloads that are going on the cluster, you're gonna have the characteristics of those. You'll have, you know, the throughputs, the IO, the IO type, you know, what's the concurrency rate? You know, how often do these things hit together? And when you go to benchmark the cluster, build your job files in a way that lets you simulate that. So you may have job files that are, you know, creating, um, say you're, you know, uh, using it for disk to disk backup for one of the use cases. So you'll have something that's creating a bunch of large sequential writes to the you know, system, but you may have someone else that's also hitting the same cluster and pulling off your know, random data for, I uh, don't know what kind of application would, would you'd be using this for, but you know, what you need to do is make sure you set those job files up in a way that you're going to at least roughly simulate what will actually happen on the cluster in a worst case scenario, right? Always plan for worst case. So if you think about that, you may need, instead of three load gens, you may, may need 20 load generators so that you can go out and actually more accurately simulate what's going to happen. And that's gonna allow you to see what's that real world performance for each one of these going to look like when they're happening all at the same time. And that's the, that's the way you should plan from a storage perspective. Yeah. So. I mean, yeah, it, it's one of those things at this level, and, and we touch on this a little bit later, I mean, you can't accurately simulate exactly what your app is doing, but it's much easier if you can get a good idea and sort of build something like this around. It's repeatable, it's testable, and it, it's something that you can do and not have to put all that infrastructure in place to get that application testing yep. and feel comfortable when you do go to those next phases. So we'll dig into object. So really, the only real tool that is out there today huh. is cost bench. <clears throat> Be nice. <laughs> I, I mean, uh, it, the, there are other tools out there, there, but I agree, there is no other industry accepted tool um, right. besides cost bench. Yeah, so there, there are some other things out there. I, uh, on the original version of the stick, I had listed a few of them. Yeah. Uh, but when it comes down to it, this is the only one that's really getting a lot of traction it does have sustained development. Intel is um, behind it, which really helps with coming up with a tool that's good and solid. And it supports just about every object type there is. All right, that's a huge key. So supports the multiple object types, can be used from the command line or a GUI. And it's got a job engine um, kind of framework to it. And it can completely beat a Rados gateway, all right? So this is off the Apollo cluster um, that we've got. If you look, we are driving, and this was not at the highest point, we're driving almost eight CPUs, and these were 2682s, I think, E5 2682v3s. We're driving almost eight of those at 100%. It's fairly impressive to be able to beat it especially considering it's using Java. <clears throat> Not my favorite. Um, another thing you need to look at is you can actually severely beat the RAM on those systems with Rados gateways, which is interesting. Now, on the other hand, on your testing node, it is chewing up some resources. You know, we've got f uh, three fully utilized cores here. Uh, this was on a one out of I would say this was one out of three testing load gen nodes uh, that I was using. And it was chewing up a little bit of RAM. Nothing significant though, but you need to make sure you have it sized for that. I will say um, at the peak when I had this system consuming nine CPUs uh, in total, uh, it was chewing up about 32 gigs of RAM. We were doing um, 12 gigabytes a second in reads off the cluster. Pretty impressive. Um, these numbers were quite a bit higher, needless to say. So where do you get it from? Go to GitHub. Uh, it's pretty easy. Again, these presentations will be available online so you can come back and reference it or you can Google Costbench. You'll find it very fast. Um, there is a susastudio.com link to an appliance. It's ready configured, ready to go. You download it, 
You can deploy it on hardware inside virtual machines to the cloud, however you need to use it. Um, I had, I talked to the Intel guys and got their blessing to stick it out there. Um, they were quite happy. Um, if you're installing it by hand, you do need Java, uh, suggest 1.8. Um, some simple things to make sure you do. If you don't do that, you know, it'll partially start and <clears throat> yeah, I, I've never done that. Um, and I would suggest the first time through, use the GUI to uh, configure a job file and then go examine the job file and learn about it because it's a little easier than looking at the samples that are out there initially. Yeah. Um, when you set it up, uh, there are two uh, files that are important. In this case, we're looking at the controller file. The controlling, you know, this makes a little more sense than FIO. The controller <laughs> is where you set up the jobs. Um, and you have, you know, some basic configuration here. You list the drivers. Those are the ones actually doing the test. So you say two drivers. Test node, here's the URL to each driver. One is the local, one is the secondary. And then your driver configuration file. Again, you give it a name uh, so it's easy to identify. And the URL to uh, itself. It's a self-referring item. And this is the GUI um, to set up a job. I shrunk it down quite a bit and still didn't get it all on screen because it's a lot of stuff. If you look over on the right-hand side, you start off with your authentication um, information right here. Uh, you have multiple stages and the documentation can walk you through the stages. Matt can probably talk you through them if you want. Uh, basically, you have the initialization stage um, your prepare stage, this is really where you end up with a lot of sequential write throughput coming into the cluster. Um, it's quite interesting to watch. That's where you see the highest write performance usually. And the main stage. So this can get actually quite interesting because you can add multiple stages to it. And under the advanced configuration, you can actually build a matrix um, to beat the system. So if you are expecting to have multiple object using applications on here with different usage patterns all at once. You can actually do some of that with this tool. It's very, very flexible. So let's look at some output. Do you want to talk about this, Matt? Um, actually, I have you talk to this a little okay. bit. I haven't used it quite as much as you have. All right. That's we fine. had an internal tool that actually did this, but it's not as good as Cosbench. Yeah. All right, so when we, when we look at the output of Cosmic, it's pretty simple. You can see the stages on the right. Um, when you get into the results uh, files, the information's maybe not quite as easy. I don't know if I've got another screen. Yeah, I do, okay. Um, so you can walk through and look. This is a call out from the general report. Really, you're gonna look at throughput, your success ratios. Um, look for failures here. You know, if you're getting a high ratio of uh, failures, that may be something you need to investigate. There's something going on um, that's cr creating problems in the and cluster. And I absolutely have seen failure rates from the Rattus Gateway. Yeah, When you absolutely. put it under this level of stress, you can see stuff kind of go yep. south. Yeah. Can yeah. Can you um, set a retry count as well for, for the failures? Or does it just fail after one try? Yeah, see, I'm not, yeah, this one I I'm not familiar with. The tool I used, there, there was an error threshold, which I think is true here too. Yes, yeah, there's an error threshold where, but that causes the, the step to stop. Yeah, right, so you yeah. instead of giving a retry, you're like, well, I can tolerate so much, but if it, so if it's a little bit dirty, it's okay, but if it hits this, then you're like, nope, that runs right. not good. Yeah, so the, the you know, in most cases, you know, um, like on the Apollo cluster, I've seen, um, under super heavy load, just a very few failures. So it'd be like 99% uh, success ratios. That's okay. It's a web-based protocol. You expect some failures and you expect that um, it's resilient to that to some extent, but you don't want to see a high ratio there. Um, again, most of these are actually pretty self-explanatory, which is fantastic. <laughs> you know, it's you know put out in columns, makes it easy. Um, you know, you have all the stages, so you can really see what's going on. Um, in the job file, you can actually make it pause between the stages so the cluster can settle, which is fantastic. Um, gives you a little better um, normalization in the way it works. Uh, the result time, again, you're looking at distributions. Um, 
of the results across. Yeah, it's the same so, sort of sum histogram. Yeah, so you're, you're looking exactly here. So, you know, when you get that 100%, you'll see the outliers, right? So you look most of the time, you know, we're pretty good on response time, but, you know, that last few, you know, we're really seeing some outliers. And that may bear some investigation. You know, is that something where, you know, from a developer perspective, what's causing that, right? And see if that's something we can ferret out. From a cluster perspective, if that's too high, um, you may want to investigate your architecture a little bit and see if there's yeah. places to optimize it. Go back, do you need journals or, you know, is your network maybe getting saturated at periods? So when you look at stages, um, this is actually interesting to, it's the naming process. Get really comfortable with that because if you get, if you look at the text output files, uh, this is how you identify where you're at. Makes it hard. Um, again, pretty simple, no error statistics in this, but it provides um, very, very verbose um, data when you dig into it. If there's errors, you can get quite a bit of information. So this was created in this step. So when you click the view details on, say, the prepare, I think that was on the prepare step, right? Yeah, yeah so that's on the prepare step. You click details over here, it's going to bring up this screen. Um, this is down at the, uh, towards the bottom that you can look at it. And you know, you're looking at throughput, response time, bandwidth, uh, ratios. Again, these are self-refreshing. These They continually refresh uh, during the process. So you can actually watch them live during the test run if you're using the GUI. Uh, it's quite interesting to look at. You, know, you look here, we're not seeing huge numbers. Uh, I think I did these on a virtual machine is where I pulled this yeah. from. And, and they're a lot easier to consume. If you've yep. ever tried to do this kind of output with file or something like that, you either have to do, like, they have the plot stuff, yeah. which is raw, yep. or you can go write your own scripting around it, and, you know, that's time. Uh, yep. So this is just, it's there, which is nice. Right. And if you do it, in, if you do this inside of Cosbench and you keep everything there, you can actually go back and refer to these results later. You can always pull it out of the archive and yeah. go back to it so you can compare a run you made two months ago versus a run you made today after changes have been. It's a nice modern increased. dashboarding thing. I mean, you think yep. of something like Grafana, or you can just say, I'm gonna save this off, I'm gonna pull it back, I'm gonna share it with people, that kind of stuff. Absolutely. So again, read and write, you can see your response times, throughputs. Uh, this is on the Apollo cluster, it had a, uh, two load gens on it. Um, I think I was running over the 10 gig interfaces for these. So not bad numbers. But again, you can see the time compression that's now happened. And again, you mouse over any point and it'll tell you what's, you know, what the response times are. Um, so I think that's towards the end of that, right? right. Yeah, tuning stuff. So I just wanna make sure I didn't have another slide. The original deck did. Um, really think about how much your solution can do, right? And plan for about the 80th percentile. Um, don't try to put something in that's maxed. That's probably not a good solution. Benchmarking is what's really gonna help you determine that. Um, Ceph supports the different IO ingest types, and it's actually useful to benchmark it you know, going back to that real world scenario, are you going to use it for object and block at the same time? If so, you're going to be kicking off some jobs from some scripts that are kicking off FIO and kicking off cost bench so they can compete with each other for the resources to really saturate that cluster and see what it can do. Is it going to meet the need? Um, you know, it would be beautiful if we could build a 40 petabyte cluster for a customer and it only serves one application because then it's very predictable. But I've been in storage for 20 years, and when you start talking unified storage and truly unified storage, you know, block, file, and object, it's going to be, everyone's going to say, hey, I need a piece of that cluster. I need to do this. I need to do that. And um, until we have quality of service tools built in, you need to understand what the impact of their application is going to be in there. So, um, yeah. Yeah, so it's just next stuff. So tuning. I want to let Matt take yeah, this Yeah, let's, let's do that. All right, so, um, and certainly jump in if there's any bullets that I'm not covering oh, yeah. on this fully. Um, 
So, I mean, we talked about SSD journals. Uh, I think there are a few cases, like if you're going as cheap as possible with big object storage, where it, it, you can potentially right. skip it. But for now, with file store and Ceph, you almost always want SSD journals. And you're going to figure out, I mean, one of the real important things to understand about that is like, what is this drive capable of? You want write intensive. You want to make sure, because you can, I've seen stuff built where the journals were actually the bottleneck and not the drives. Because yes. they just, the ratio of what they did, there's too much bandwidth going to this journal. Um, you, you can certainly still have much more performance with uh, spinning if you got enough of it. Um, this battery back cache and, and write back is nice. Not only does it help level performance, but what I've really seen for sort of like bursts of write and things like that, you're, even SSDs in VM, you're just going to get great performance by going and saying, I have this ability to just post these writes out here. And it really, it really helps smooth things out. Yes. Yeah. So, and another thought on that, when I, when I said it, and if you look at the reference designs that we've done, I always set it to a 90% yeah. bias towards write back. That leaves us 10% on the read ahead, which is quite useful. Um, when you're dealing with, you know, maybe there's a lot of activity, you know, going into the cluster. Yeah, write back cache is really helping, but that read ahead can really help accelerate that read out process. So it's worth the investment. You know, you're talking a controller that's maybe, I don't know, thousand dollars additional per node, that you know may give you, you know, an extra ten percent in peak performance. Yeah. I mean, th I mean, there are cases you can go in with an HBA, but what we've seen is there yeah. really is some sort of ease of use and value that you're going to get out of having that right back cache there. Um, yes. So it, it's worth considering for the cost. This performance bias thing, it may be that in your particular environment, um, you're going to have to turn, I mean, power saving or something along right. those lines. But you are going to want to go back and do a kind of a dual pass thing. If you want to simplify your life, make sure that you start with that performance set and performance bias. Because yep. you can get weird latency behavior, uh, weird things with uh, misevaluating your CPU usage. And just so you, you want to kind of crank it up to start with, if nothing else. And this thing right here, this block diagram, uh, I would hope that some of this can be clear by the time you actually get your hardware in, but it's always good to double check um, yep. because you can have stuff in terms of uh, SAS and SATA lanes, expanders, um, how you've got your controllers set up, and th there's a little bit more about that further too. But you can, you can bottleneck in a place that just is unexpected perhaps, and really hard to get past if you don't design yeah. right. So does everyone know what a block diagram is? Okay. So those, those of you don't come talk to Matt afterwards. <laughs> he, he and I can talk about it. Uh, yeah. We've both seen them. So, and to that point, <clears throat> these bullets right here about pneuma pinning and interrupt distribution, I, you can certainly, I mean, there is some complexity behind this, but one of the things about Ceph in particular and the design that we've seen, when you have these larger boxes where you go off and you say, I have no choice because of the density or requirements, like let's say you have, you're trying to do an NVMe uh, sort of box. Yep. So you've got a, a multi um, socket setup, you're going to get NUMA involved, you're going to have that traffic in between the sockets and it can actually be a big deal. You also have from some of this impact up here, you want to make sure that as much as possible, you're going to keep everything um, certainly on the same socket, but maybe even if you can on the same core, because you have real caching benefits that you can get out of that. There are, I mean, just the one of these, any one particular thing individually may not be a lot, but it can add up and you can really have a much more efficient CPU story, um, which is, ends up being cost by going off and doing this level of tuning. And, and certainly, if you push it the most possible, you will see a big performance difference out of doing or not doing this. Um, then this is more around typically the driver and stuff like that. Some of these things don't just kind of distribute by default to be as wide as possible. So you're gonna wanna look at that for um, your controller driver. And finally right here, uh, what we've seen in, uh, this is probably more about a uh, bandwidth consideration, but even from the standpoint of doing small block, I mean, you can get less transactions um, by having a jumbo frame for a standard 4K um, versus a, a standard Ethernet MTU. And this really, because what we're seeing with Ceph now with all the work they've put into it, the network bottleneck is real and, and it's there. So being able to get that more out of the way, doing less packet transaction can give you a big benefit. So 
and we talked about this, of course, in terms of the application workload stuff. The placement group thing, it kind of, it's good to remind people about this. You aren't necessarily going to get a massive performance boost out of doing it right, but you're going to see degradation if you do it wrong. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so, I mean, you go in, you look at the recommendations, um, and anyway, you've got guidance and stuff out there, but make sure that, especially you have a complicated uh, architecture with a bunch of pools, that you figure out what it's going to look like for your cluster, and you may even have to readjust if you create other pools over time. Um, disabling OS, this scrub thing is good, but only during performance evaluation. Um, I mean, it, good, the good thing is Seth will warn you that it's off. But uh, it is nice. I have actually seen where you get these weird blips if you forget to turn it off because you, you've got active I.O. going on to do scrubs and deep scrubs. But, you know, just do that during that performance thing when you're only looking at that particular case. Yeah? Just blending it, you know, comparing against real world situations. You're absolutely right. You want to turn it back on. If this is only for the case where you're going to go off and say, how far can I push it? Once you're doing that evaluation right. and you turn on, say, especially if you get to your app, Never turn it off if you're going to have, I mean, unless you like data corruption, in which case that's fine. <laughs> right. Um, verify acceptable performance and latency, the, the scale up stuff. This one is pretty big because anyone who's actually run um, Ceph in an enterprise deployment over time has seen this. Uh, because, well, I mean, stuff like Open Attic is actually a really big deal to me from an enterprise standpoint. It has not been the easiest to figure out what's going on with the hardware in a cluster. Um, so when you have one of these disks, it's one thing. If you have an array controller, you have RAID 0 drives, and it completely fails out, you're probably going to get something. I mean, this drive went terrible. You've got something in the BMC. You've got an LED on or whatever. But one of the things that we all run into is these drives that sort of get slow. And based on the way Ceph has that sort of let's hash everything across, your lowest common denominator <laughs> will drag you down. And even just during benchmarking, especially because you're beating it up, I have seen this hit. And then all of a sudden, it's like, I can't reproduce my results. My results are terrible, and I don't understand why. So you're going to want to make sure you stay ahead of degraded disks. And one of the things he was talking about, that battery back cache, if you are comfortable with having that, you're not going for lowest cost with an HPA, and you're like, I trust the controller I've got, there are some additional mount options when you're using file store that can improve performance. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Let's. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That 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 will that will help. Yeah. Yeah, and you can do some stuff also looking at transactions if you're willing to turn on the debugging to enough level and so yeah, that there's things there too. Yeah, and it, you know, on that same path, if you don't see anything from that perspective, you know, when you're when you're looking at the, from the Ceph, you know, at the OSD bench, yeah, you may want to step out, go back to that block diagram of the server, and then take FIO yeah. and beat everything on a bus and see what's happening. See if you end up with that bus maybe is getting overloaded or there's something yeah. on it flaky, right? And never forget system logs. <laughs> yes. Yeah, Peter. Um, I would not put that command line in there if there's no, no. battery back cache. Uh, very specifically, not the no barrier. Yeah, the no barrier is the <laughs> wicked evil one. <laughs> that, could, that could generate... I, the, I, I have no problem with iNode yeah. 64, I, and that's actually probably a good practice thing anyway. Um, and I think actually the no A time thing may be a default, but this is just everything popped out as yeah. to what you have. Yeah, I know when we've done HDFS benchmarking, we did that back in Nuremberg before, uh, some white papers. We were doing, I can't remember the exact parameters, but we were doing something similar but without the no barrier. Right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so so if if you uh, don't have it don't have a battery back cache, don't turn that on because that <laughs> throws your data survivability out the window. Yeah. Uh, I mean there's certainly I try to. I mean, there are corner cases where you do need to go dig a little bit more into what XFS is doing down there. I think that's one of the big reasons. Uh, well, there's a number, but the attempt to do blue stores to get some of this out there because XFS is not free. I mean, it, it has things it does. Yeah. 
Uh, all right, so there, here are some things in terms of block tuning, and these two I don't recommend probably ever, but you will see this stuff out there in terms of people that are trying to push the envelope. Right. Um, you can, this top one, if you're really convinced, I've talked to a customer who tried this out, and I think you can probably, for a dev cluster where you're happy with losing your data, you could probably try to put this together. But, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. What, what, you, what you see this with right now is in NVMe testing. Yeah. Because of the problem with efficiency in the OSD software, people will go and they will put like four, right? And so, yeah, you can keep the QDEP higher and it's busier, and you can theoretically play games with a crush map to where you say, I, I probably have good data durability, but don't trust it. I mean, it's, it's really not set up to do that. Um, it, it does give it more impressive benchmarking numbers, but in the end, you probably are buying this because you want to use it for data you want to preserve. Right. So, this right here, this is another thing. You can get um, unequivocal performance boosts by turning off authentication and log. And actually, there are cases where if you've got the infrastructure of the cluster protected, if turning off authentication is probably okay. But it's just more sane to make sure that you have a base level of logging and the authentication on than it is to say, I'm trying to get an extra 10% out of this and I've given up ability to track down problems. Because, I mean, the community, this is one of the first things they go to when you have a problem. It's just like, let's, let's see what you've actually get out of all the OSD logs, um, you know, what you get out of the outlier information, things like that. And certainly, yeah, the authentication thing, I mean, we're looking at some of the stuff with file system center. If you don't have that, you kind of say, hey, look, it's all open. I hope that everyone on top of me set it up in a protected yeah. way. Well, we are the open, open company, right? Yeah. You know, Susa, <laughs> but we wouldn't even recommend that. Information wants to be free. <laughs> um, so this is something I have actually seen. I mean, they're, one of the things that you've seen from the general uh, sort of tuning thing in terms of Ceph settings, there isn't a silver bullet. If there is, they've already put it in as the default. But you do see for people that are trying to uh, push stuff on Flash, they will play around with the sharding and the number of threads per shard on the Flash. I haven't ever seen it be like a, a world breaker, but apparently you can get some performance out of it. And if you really are trying to push the envelope, this is a stable thing you can use. Um, and this is one other thing to consider. The RBD caching is now on by default, and I think that's a good default, but there are cases where you might not necessarily want the penalty of the caching layer. It is, let's say, not optimal, if you've ever looked through some of the code, and sometimes maybe you just don't want that level of volatile client caching. I mean, it is certainly good for a VM use case where you're like, oh, I don't really care if I lose that, everything's gonna be destroyed, it's ephemeral storage in a cloud, but you know, perhaps that's not what you're writing to. So, talking to this, this is something that I ran into very early on. One of the things about the way they do block under the hood and the, the object blobs they have is you end up with eventually a fairly predictable set of files back there in the backing file store. But if you're really using just this kind of open object thing and you're committing maybe a, a chunk of very small objects, this, you know, a lot of your different object transactions, but a few large ones or whatever, you're gonna grow, obviously, your inodes very quickly. And they do this balancing act back there with where they place everything under the placement groups for Ceph. Well, what's bad about this in particular, and it, you will get penalties as you get a really full cluster, and there's stuff you know, with metadata there. They expect it out of a file system. But when you hit to where they're doing a rebalancing, if you watch a performance graph, you have a, like a certain level, and then all of a sudden it just floors down and then the balancing finishes out, and then it comes back up to another layer with a new metadata, and it will floor down again. So understanding your ingest kind of over time, if you really have like a long-term object thing, it can be important to know how this is going to play around with what's coming into your cluster and what people are gonna see for an SLA. So you, th this is the kind of thing, if you're gonna do benchmarking for fills, you'll really be able to understand what's happening with that. Erasure coding, one of the things that Ceph has is four trillion different options for erasure coding. Um, I, I will say there are a couple, the SHEC thing for rebuild and the pyramid coding stuff, the local coding, they're a little more niche. Their default code is just fine, but if you are running on x86, as many of us are, you can get benefits on the CPU side, and Intel has put work into making sure that the ISA plugin is there, functional and stable. All right, so I'll let you conclude it out, walk us out of here. All right, thanks, man. No worries. So at the end, make sure you're benchmarking the right things. Benchmark what's important 
to the environment that you're trying to address. Okay? Use the right tools the right way. Think about how you need to apply them together to achieve a real world result, not just you know the synthetic benchmark that looks really good in say Storage Review Magazine, <laughs> someplace like that, right? Um, but you know, really, really think about it because it's important. You know, when we're when we're talking about a cluster that's going into an enterprise environment, that it meet the expectations. You know, and that's what this is all about. If you perform the baseline, make sure you save the configurations. Yes. That way your next baseline uses the same configuration. Just a tip from someone that maybe hasn't saved it in the past. I, I, I think uh, I, I can give you the same tip from someone else who's played that game. Yeah. yeah. And again, if you're tuning your config, um, version control is a beautiful thing. <laughs> All right. So any questions? <laughs> Sweet, we answered everything. Everything to know about, about performance. Yes, thank you for coming, I'm guys. Retiring now.